wonderful to be here today. And for any of you who have recently driven east along Oregon's Highway 84 out towards the Columbia River Gorge and have seen this huge proliferation of wind turbines dotting the landscape of the Columbia River Plateau, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today because over the last couple of years, we've seen a huge increase in the number of wind turbines. And I think different people respond very differently emotionally and aesthetically to this increase in power supply. Two different people have a very different reaction, but the numbers really tell a very, very interesting story. Over just the past five years, the amount of wind energy interconnected to the grid in Oregon and Washington has increased by a factor of seven, from 500 megawatts in 2006 to over 3,500 megawatts today. That's about enough electricity to power seven cities the size of Portland, a huge amount of growth. Now, what's driving this growth? Well, there's a few things. First of all, we now have laws on the books in Oregon, Washington, and California that require our electrical utilities to get a pretty significant fraction of their electricity from renewable resources. We also have legislation at the federal level, a production tax credit that, allow, that supports the resources economically to generate as much power as possible. We have very favorable siting and permitting policies in some of our rural counties. We've also got a significant amount of transmission capacity lying in the air to move this power to load. And we've benefited enormously from the availability of the regional hydroelectric dams to provide the necessary backup flexibility and capacity to help manage the variability of the output of these resources. What's actually happening out there in the Columbia River Gorge is really a sort of a microcosm of what's going on in other parts of the country where we're sort of adopting public policy to increase the amount of renewable energy in our power supply and to displace the output of our traditional fossil fire generators, the coal plants and the natural gas plants, which are a significant contributor of carbon into our atmosphere. And the wind development that's been happening in the Pacific Northwest has really been an amazing boon in many ways. It's been a huge economic stimulus to some of our most economically depressed counties. It has brought a large number of very innovative and dynamic and growing companies to Portland. And it's contributed to a legacy of clean energy and economic development that really stretches back to the 1930s with the advent of the, of the hydroelectric resources here in the Northwest. That's Franklin Delano Roosevelt down there in the bottom right for any of you who don't recognize him. <clears throat> But, the, but this really rapid, sort of almost unexpectedly rapid growth of wind energy in the Pacific Northwest has also begun to sort of stretch the physical and institutional capacity of our power system. One of the things we've done is we've put a whole bunch of these wind turbines right out there in one general part of the grid out in Oregon and Washington. The reason we're doing this is because it's extremely costly and time consuming to put new transmission lines in the area. It's virtually impossible under certain circumstances. And so what the utilities have done is we've built all this wind in one area, but the operational consequence of that is when you get this big gust of wind sort of burning its way through the Columbia River Gorge, all those wind turbines sort of ramp up and down simultaneously at the same time. There are times when the, the amount of wind can go from zero to 3,000 megawatts and back within a couple of hours. That puts a huge strain on the region's hydroelectric resources, which are, need to be able to balance all that generation to maintain reliability. We're also seeing situations now in the springtime when the hydro has to run at maximum capacity in order to avoid violating spill requirements to protect fish, and the wind generators are also economically incentivized to produce all the time. That creates this oversupply condition, which we're now having to try to figure out how to work our way through in a reliable and sort of equitable fashion. So we're sitting here today in April of 2011 with about 3,500 megawatts of wind on the system. And when you look at the regulatory demand that's on the books, we could have as much as 8,000 megawatts of wind energy in this region by 2020. So here we are as the utility system at its own crossroads asking how are we going to continue to scale up this massive amount of renewable energy generation while simultaneously maintaining reliability, meeting our multiple environmental and legal statutes, and also doing it in a way that doesn't have unsustainable cost increases or cost shifts for our customer base. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that I think the, the regional utility community, a lot of folks working quite collaboratively together, we're actually working off of a blueprint uh, that we put together back in 2007 called the Northwest Wind Integration Action Plan. We're updating it now for the next phase. And we're doing a whole bunch of stuff to sort of innovate and manage this change. One of the first things we're working on is we're working on improving wind forecasting on the grid. It's, the volatility and the variability of that resource requires you to carry big amounts of reserve generation to sort
sort of back up to maintain reliability. Well, if you can forecast that generation more, more accurately, you can actually reduce the amount of reserves that you have to carry. And so we are now, we are now integrating new forecasting and situational awareness tools right in the heart of our system operations to give our grid operators greater, greater visibility to what's actually happening on the transmission grid and to predict problems. The other thing, most people don't realize that energy is, electricity is actually bought and sold like a commodity on the grid and it's scheduled on an hourly basis between these different utilities. Well, right now we're scheduling on an hourly basis, but with all that wind on the system, we're starting to shrink our scheduling intervals down to 30 minutes to better react to the system. The other thing I've mentioned is we're starting to tap out the hydroelectric dams as a source of flexibility to provide all this integration capability. So we're now starting to go out and purchase flexibility from other forms of generation. For example, the region's natural gas plants are now being pulled into that dispatch to provide flexibility. As a matter of fact, some of the wind generators are providing their own balancing resources for the grid. It's kind of an odd concept, but they're doing that. But we're not stopping on the supply side of the equation. We're actually now moving deep into the demand side. And what I'm about to tell you is not Buck Rogers' fantasy, it's actually true. We're now starting to try to get system flexibility out of the hot water heaters in people's basements. Okay, so what you do, it's three o'clock in the morning, right? You get this big unanticipated swing of wind energy onto the grid, and we're figuring out how to actually send electronic signals to hot water heaters to increase their consumption so that they can mop up some of that excess energy and help maintain the reliability of the power grid. Okay, so you put a whole bunch of these hot water heaters together in big networks, and you've basically got a massive source of distributed storage on the grid. As a matter of fact, it's sort of this marriage of communication and control technology combined with distributed resources throughout the grid that people call the smart grid. And I can tell you it actually has the potential to play a huge role in the future of the system. And this region, I think, will probably be on the absolute bleeding edge of smart grid development for the, next, for the, for the foreseeable future. One thing I want to mention, very, very consistent with the themes we've been talking about today. You can do all this technological evolution, and we'll do forecasting and state awareness and demand response and smart grid, but at the end of the day, one of the most important things for this region is to increase the collaboration and communication and coordination between the different system operators on the grid. In the Pacific Northwest alone, we have 10 or more individual system operators known as balancing authorities, each managing their own portion of the transmission grid, okay, with their own resources. But there happens to be a significant amount of diversity in the patterns of load and generation and even wind between those different system operators. So what, we're, what we need to try to do is to spread the variability and the volatility of the wind over a much broader portfolio of load and resource diversity. Something we've begun to work on actually in the Northwest is, is to take a look at this on a very wide area. And as a matter of fact, Oregon and Washington are part of a much broader western grid that actually extends all the way from British Columbia down to the border of Texas. And so what we're now talking about doing is establishing an energy imbalance market that would stretch across a significant portion of this territory so that you could net the variability of wind up in Washington and Oregon with the variability of wind and hydro in, in Montana and potentially solar down in the desert southwest and, and allow the pooling of all those different supply and demand side resources to contribute economically to the demand for flexibility across that system and to reduce the overall need for reserve generation and make the system operate much more efficiently. As a matter of fact, this might be the next sort of evolutionary step in a physical consolidation of many of those individual balancing authorities across the West. Now, this region has tried for quite a while to get a market like this in place. These things do exist in other parts of the world and the country. We've typically struggled uh, for, to sort of prove out the business case, to deal with some of the jurisdictional and governance issues, but I'm guardedly optimistic that we're gonna get there this time, because I think that spirit of collaboration in the region is really picking up. I would also say that we're gonna to have to work really hard to make, the, to make sure that our public policy is consistent with the operational needs of the grid and doesn't create unintended consequences in our markets like we're beginning to see here in the Pacific Northwest. I think the one thing I also have to mention is that it's likely that we're gonna to have to build some transmission capacity to increase the interactivity between these different regions. But at the end of the day, it's these, these, these principles of leveraging diversity and pooling flexibility that are ultimately gonna allow us to scale up our renewable energy fleet, maximize its environmental value, minimize cost to customers, and ultimately keep the lights on for our national electricity grid. 
So thank you very much.